Okay, so let's get started with this uh, partial differential equation. That's the topic for today. And it's the topic for today because it's essentially like an introduction or a precursor to fluids, which we will, um, which I will start on Wednesday. And then, oh, next week is spring break, right? If I'm remembering correctly. And then with the week afterwards, then we'll do the second part of fluids. Uh, Harmony Lee will cover that. She's our local expert on fluids because I will be gone. Uh, doing an insane amount of traveling this semester, unfortunately. But she's, she's very good at that. And I will give you the basics this, this, this week. And this will be our third and final homework. That will be the fluidy, fluidy one. And after that is only the final project. So that's where we are. And the PDEs, that's, uh, oh, put the light on. PDEs, well, uh, one motivation would be like this. Fluids are governed by Navier-Stokes equations. Navier-Stokes equations are a very important example of a nonlinear PDE. So sort of that's why we go over PDEs, over the basics of PDEs uh, here first. They have, of course, many other applications in graphics, not just in fluid simulation, but it also serves as a good introduction to uh, fluid simulation. Um, let's see. So what we have done before, we have before dealt with ODEs, right? Ordinary differential equations. So maybe we can spend a minute to remind ourselves what's the difference between OD and PD and why did we not encounter PDEs before? PDEs for partial differential equations, we had before ODEs for ordinary differential equations. So the ordinary meant that we are differentiating that just with respect to one variable, right? Time, right? So PDE means that we are differentiating with respect to multiple variables, typically space. So you will typically see some T and X. We will do some simple examples in a second. Why did we not have to deal with that before? We have already done rigid bodies. We have already done soft bodies. And PDEs never came up yet. <laughs> Why is that? Because we were just dealing with springs. Correct, because the space was essentially discretized for us using the particles, right? So the PDEs basically, they assume continuous model for both time and space. So it, even space now will be considered as continuum. That makes a lot of sense uh, if, if we are talking about fluid dynamics, right? Or flu fluids in general. And if you wanna do that in elasticity, and that, that's what I will cover uh, probably later, you will get finite element method. So we will actually uh, touch on uh, some Simple instance of finite elements already today. Hopefully we'll get there. So I guess this is the overview. I'll also do the classification of PDEs. Let's just let's just get to it. <coughs> Don't need to spend too much time introducing. Oh yeah, I guess let me comment on that like this. So I guess the natural intellectual development is that first you sort of hate the PDEs because it's some sort of like mathematical puzzle, which is like, like an equation, right? And you solve it. It's an equation where the unknown is a function, but you can just be looking at it as a mathematical problem. And there is like ton, tons of theory and you can take entire classes. I, I took some class a long time ago and since then I forgot everything. And this, this, this is really just, um, uh, the, the very, very basics of that. But the cool thing is that later you realize that actually it's not just a mathematical problem per se, but it really relates to lots of cool natural phenomena. And in graphics and physics-based simulation, it's really beautiful because you can, you can use it to model a lot of beautiful effects. Everybody usually, always loves the fluids and work because you can generate some, some cool looking smoke. That's, that's what we will be doing. And, and other nice effects, but also other cool things like the Laplace equation, that's what we will talk about, that's used a lot in graphics because it's just visually beautiful. <laughs> it gives you some nice, smooth, nat natural, natural looking functions, and the PDEs are essentially the theory behind that. So it's definitely something worth uh, investigating. Okay, so I, I guess I can do again the, the usual spiel is that like mat mathematicians traditionally try to solve the PDEs uh, analytically, right? And there's a lot of important work on that. We should not be discounting that. But what we'll be talking about mostly are uh, numerical uh, solutions. Meaning dis discretize the domain somehow. Don't solve it precisely, but solve it up to some discretization error. So here we have yet the same uh, situation in ODEs. 
Ah, this is what I sort of was meaning before when I was talking about the difference between ODs and PDs. I guess I was getting ahead of myself. So this is a typical example of an OD, right? That's what we were uh, studying quite a lot when we were talking about explicit and implicit uh, time integration, right? That was actually the case where you had where you found out that we have to worry a lot about the numerical uh, solution method, right? Like the, the continuous form, the continuous uh, math is sort of like the ideal uh, world, but in uh, in if you want to really solve some numerical uh, discrete approximations, we have to worry about all sorts of things, right? Like stability and explicit or what to do, uh, how to approximate this nicely. Yeah, and PDE essentially says that we now are looking into functions of multiple variables. So here the u, if I should give it a type, that would be a function of two variables going from R to 2R. Do you know what this PDE is? It's a very famous type of partial differential equation. You do, anyone else does? Wave equation, that's, that's correct. And I will do, there is like, a, like an entire zoo of PDEs, which I will introduce you to a little bit, unless you have seen it already. Uh, this, I think, is an example of a hyperbolic PD, but we will uh, go through that. So let's do a cool, uh, a simple but cool uh, 1D example. This is essentially the, the very basics of uh, fluid transport called advection. Do you know what it means, advection? Uh, or sometimes it's called convection also. This essentially means that there is some, some medium which is being transported. I guess it will make more sense after I explain this. So let's look at this example. Here we have a country. Do you know what country is that? Russia. <laughs> Russia? <laughs> Does it look like Russia? <laughs> no, it's not Russia. That's a good guess too. I guess it's trickier than I thought. It might uh, help if I tell you that I borrowed these slides from my colleagues from ETH Zurich. <laughs> So yes, it's Switzerland. Yeah, and as we were talking, as, 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 as it brings back the memories. Um, once we were rock climbing in the Swiss Alps somewhere around here, and I met there a, uh, a Polish climber, and she said that she's a mathematician, and her area was uh, PDEs. <laughs> Apparently, other, but uh, it seems that outside of math departments, there is not so many jobs, so she was just a climber. <laughs> But maybe she got a job since then. Okay, so what we are looking at, so we will actually abstract the Switzerland away. We will be looking just as one dimensional approximation on, on this didactic example, okay? So we have just a one axis for space. So imagine whole Switzerland fits into this, this, this one line. And let's do like a very, very baby example of a for weather forecast, okay? So our uh, weather model is, is just like a joke, but it's, um, <laughs> I can explain the basic principles on this um, toy example. So the, this, this capital T goes for temperature. Don't confuse it with lowercase t, which goes for time. That's, that's a standard physics notation. Don't yell at me, I did not come up with that. So we have some initial temperature profile in the country. So this is, this is where it is, right? So somewhere near Lausanne, it's sort of cold. And then as you go, as you go more inside, then it gets warmer and then it's cold again. <coughs> And uh, the other thing we have there, we have a wind which blows with speed C in the direction of the positive x axis, okay? Super simple model. And what we, what we want to do here is to uh, find uh, the evolution of the temperature distribution, right? So as the, this, is, this is the temperature, as the wind blows to the right, it will certainly be shifting this, this entire function to the right, right? And what we will use it for, we will use it to uh, derive the 1D uh, version of uh, a direction equation, which is, I guess, the simplest possible example of a PDE, which, which can already give you an idea what, what, what this business is about. Make sense? Okay, so let's see, let's see how can we actually derive the PDE. That's sort of a cool thing, right? Because we have, right, right now we have some sort of like idea, problem, what we want to model, right? And now we need to find the PDE that will um, model this system. So let's see how we do how we do that. So the capital T that's uh, that's our temperature, right? So that's also a function from R two to R. The one parameter is the spatial location, and the other parameter is is the is is time. 
So here you already see the pattern. There is space and time parameters. Both of them are continuous. So that's R2, right? So let's see how we could describe the evolution of the temperature profile subject to this wind speed uh, C. So um, how can we do this? So let's see. So if we are at some point X, we can uh, think what happens after time advances with some time step delta t. Okay, so this is, at least this is one way how you can derive it. Okay, so if I move uh, delta t time forward, if I make a small uh, step forward, at, I, I'm let's say I'm at some point x here, and this whole thing moves forward. Well, what happens? This whole thing shifted, right? So what value I will get here? Well, I will get the value that was um, uh, C delta T before, right? It's moving. So during the time delta T, this moved uh, C delta T to the right. So basically the value here will now translate here, right? That's, that's the very idea of the wind carrying it forward. So, so, so if, I, if I write as a formula, I need to look at the position X minus C delta T at time t. So that's 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 my current time. I look I look back and if the time step at least if the time step t is delta t is small, this is what will happen. Actually even if it's large, that in, in this simple case it doesn't really matter. Okay, makes sense? Okay, so now now what we can do is we can approximate both of the sides with Taylor expansion. So we will uh, write this like this. So he will do the derivative of our function capital T, that's what we are solving for, times delta T plus some error, which is delta T squared. And here we have a similar thing, minus the derivative by x, C delta T, plus also some O delta T squared error. Can you still see that? Yeah. Is it visible? So this is just a Taylor uh, expansion with respect to the delta t, right? Here, here we got the derivative with respect to x because it was in the first argument. Here it was the second argument. So the dx delta, uh, the this txt that can go away, right? It will subtract away, and what I will get is the derivative by t delta t plus um, c delta t by x. Oh, sorry differential of t by x times delta t plus some error of delta t squared. Okay. Uh, I guess I can, what I can do is I can divide by this delta t and what I will get if I divide by it, I will get this plus um, c delta t by x plus O delta, because I divided it, the square becomes just a non-square. And then if we say, if we take the limit with delta t going to zero, so if delta t is really small, that we can as well discard this term, right? If delta t goes to zero, this, this goes to zero. So if we, if we take the limit for delta t going smaller and smaller, that's really the main idea of the idealization with, with continuum math, right? If you, you basically say that these first order uh, approximations are exact. Then we are left with uh, this PDE. That's what I was trying to get to. Equals zero. And this is what is known as the 1D advection equation. And that's the simplest example of uh, PDE, which we which we'll look at. So let's uh, just uh, make sure we, we understand what 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 the, what this means. We are looking for a two D function, which satisfies this uh, this property. So if we take the partial derivative with respect to the first parameter t or second parameter t, and with respect to the first one, multiply by c if we get zero, okay? So typically you, you, would, you would start, you would, you would be already given a PDE because all these uh, physical processes were, were studied a long time ago. So what you, what you typically look up are, are already the PDEs, and then you can think about what is the solution. 
Does this make sense? Any questions? So let's take a look. Let's let's assume somebody gave you this PD, which, which corresponds to 1D advection. So again, that the model is that we have this temperature profile just being advected to the right, which means like being carried, carried um, by some wind or something like that. Okay. So what is the solution of this? In this case, the solution is sort sort of simple because it's such a such a toy example. But we will use it to il illustrate the difference between the analytical and uh, discrete numerical solution. Okay. So here in this case, we have the luxury that we are actually able to write down the absolutely perfect analytical solution, right? What, what do you think will be the perfect solution? In this case, it's really, really dumb, right? I didn't really even have to formulate the PD to, to sort of guess what the solution is, right? Someone other than you <laughs> has a clue? Okay. okay. Well, any function of x minus ct. Ex that's exactly right, yes. So any function f x minus ct will be a solution. So that's what I have here. So you know what, let me copy the PDE here. So we are solving, so let's assume we are solving this PDE, okay? And you can absolutely forget about any temperatures and Switzerland's and winds and whatever. And you can just really look at it as a mathematical problem, right? That we need to find a 2D function t which satisfies this, this equation, okay? And in this case, the solution is, is really like uh, presenting itself. The solution is if I take arbitrary function, 1D function f, here the f is just r to r function, and I define the 2D function, I'll pay attention, that's important. This is 2D function, 1D function. And I, I, I say that the TXT is fx minus ct. So the c, uh, remember, that's just a constant scalar. That's the speed of the wind, right? The x and t are variables, but the c is a constant, like 5 or something. So why this is a solution? Well, that's, that's, that's very easy to see, right? Because if we differentiate this, if we, if we take this and compute the derivative with respect to t, then we will certainly get minus c. That's the, that's the chain rule, right? x minus ct, and if, if I compute the derivative with respect to x, I will get the derivative without any, any other stuff. So certainly if I multiply the partial by x with c and add it to this, I will get zero. So indeed, for any function f, the t defined like this solves this PDE, okay? And if you think about it, it, it makes perfect sense, right? If you, if you go back to the intuition of the wind blowing a temperature profile in, in one direction, then that, that's exactly what's happening here, right? Because the CT only means that we are translating the function with speed C. That's, that's, that's all, okay? So the, the fact that it works for arbitrary function, that's, yeah, question? Yeah, how to how to get the solution analytically? You would have to talk to a mathematician, like the, like this, like go to the Swiss Alps rock climbing, and you'll probably find some of them there, <laughs> or to our math department. There's uh, not not to me. I <laughs> how to get there? What I know that there is like this this like a, I I took a class on that too. It's like a cookbook, and there are like recipes how you can solve certain types of PDEs. So that's my <laughs> ten, ten seconds hands for. It's sort of, for, for, for us, it doesn't really matter because th this is really just like to, to illustrate things. We will never be using analytical solutions. Okay, um, yeah, so what I was saying, uh, or any other, any other questions? What I was saying is uh, the fact that we can pick arbitrary f, that means that the solution is not fully determined unless I specify some initial conditions, right? In this case of the temperature profile, the initial conditions meant that I have to tell you what is the temperature profile at time zero, right? At some specific instance of time when I'm start. If you are doing a weather prediction, weather forecast model, you probably need to collect the data first, right? And then start predicting from there. So I need some T zero, which, which, which will be my initial condition. And the T zero will essentially play the role of F, right? 
So if I, if I know the t0 at some instance of time, let's call this instance of time 0, time 0, why? because any, any, anything is fine. So then uh, for now if t0 is given, then I have one unique solution. And that's just translating the function to the right. Very, very simple. Okay. Does everybody see that if, if c is positive, then we are translating it to the right, right? Because this means subtract from the left, so that means that the whole function shifts to the right. Am I getting it right? It's, this is probably a little bit confusing. Yeah, I think that's that's what it is. Okay. Oh, here is another um, interesting bit that I noted it down. I don't know if I've forgotten. Uh, one interesting thing which will actually uh, become important when we will talk about fluids. Like, by, by the way, this, this already is essentially motion of fluid in 1D, right? So we will build, build on this uh, on Wednesday. We'll talk about fluids in 2D and 3D. But uh, here the, the derivative of uh, the temperature, capital T, with respect to time, that means that I, what is, what is the interpretation of this? What does it mean that the derivative of temperature with respect to time is minus some constant times the derivative of temperature with respect to space? Well, that means that I have an observer sitting somewhere here on top of a mountain or something. And the observer is measuring how the temperature is changing in time. Okay, so that's because that's, that's what the derivative by t means, right? That means what are the changes of temperature as, as time goes. And this just says that the changes of temperature in time are proportional with respect to constant minus c to uh, to to the der to the slope of uh, this function here, and if you think about it, that actually makes perfect sense, right? Because if I have some temperature profile which which looks like maybe I should oh let's put it here. So if I have a temperature profile that looks like this, so that means um, the spatial derivative, the derivative with respect to x, goes up, okay. Then what does that mean? Then the observer here, the derivative with respect to time, will be doing what? If c is positive. Let's say that c is positive, so the wind is going to the right. So if this is being all advected to the right, the temperature will be going down, right? That's because uh, I have this positive c and I have minus c times, and this if this derivative here is positive, so if this delta t by x is positive, that means that this observer sitting here will observe it's getting cooler, right? The temperature is going down. And that makes sense, right? Because you take this and you're translating this to the right, so the temperature is actually cooling off, right? So that's, that's sort of like an, another type of intuition you can have. Similarly, if, if, if it happened to be flat, if the temperature profile was constant, right? What does it mean for the, for the spatial derivative? Well, it means the spatial derivative is zero, right? So the observer sitting here and measuring temperature will be seeing no difference, right? Because it's just, if this is the air, it's just being replaced by air of the same temperature, right? And similarly, if, if it's going down, if the spatial derivative is negative, then, th then the observer will see that it's getting warmer. Right. And it's not getting warmer because the, the, the molecules of air, uh, quote, double quote, 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 unquote, would be getting warmer, but because the material uh, moves, right? The air shifts from one side to another. Cold air is replaced by hot air, or hot air is replaced by cold air. So that's why an observer sitting here sees the difference. Even though if, if, if a single molecule had a temperature, even though the, mo the temperature of every single molecule is not changing. Okay, I'm making this point because we will come back to it when we'll be talking about the difference between Eulerian and Lagrangian viewpoints, which is important because in fluids we will be looking at both, but we will start with the Eulerian one, which is quite, quite good for fluids. Okay. So this, I'm, I'm sort of making these discussions so you can build up some intuition about uh, PDEs basically de uh, sort of develop some intuition behind what these symbols mean. And if you think about it, it's, it sort of make, all makes perfect sense. <laughs> oh, 
Okay. So this is the analytical solution. In this case, it's easy, even though I don't have a principled way of telling you how, how to uh, get it for arbitrary PD. But here, here we do. Here we use it to uh, compare it against numerical solution. So that's what we will be using almost exclusively in physics-based simulation, numerical solution. That's what we were doing before for ODEs, right? So the numerical solution means that we sort of let go of the beautiful continuous math and instead we discretize the problems. So uh, in a sense, we convert the partial differential equations into a set of algebraic equations which we can solve. So if the PDE was linear, uh, then we get uh, uh, linear equations back and we solve them by solving linear systems, going back to linear algebra. So let's take a look how the numerical solution works for, for this 1D advection example. So uh, first we need to create some discretization, right? So we essentially do a 2D grid. So in one dimension, we'll be discretizing the space, right? So if you okay, I can bring this, this back. So if we have this uh, spatial dimension, then we essentially put there lots of sample points. And the idea is if, if you put, the, put a lot of samples there, then it will be essentially as good as the continuous solution. That's sort of like the idea of the numerical solution. Or, or better said, if we will be refining that, if we'll be putting there more and more samples, then hopefully we will converge to the true continuous, con continuous solution. With enough samples, we'll get close. So um, the T0 will mean, so the, the upper, the, sub, the superscript will be for time. So this um, T0 is the initial temperature profile. That's what would be given. That's what, that's what would be the initial condition. And the X is the spatial, spatial dimension. Okay, so this would be like, this, this would have like a unit of meters or something like this. And, and the time would have units of seconds or something like this. Okay, so that's, that's our discretized domain. Somebody gives us the initial temperature profile. And what we need to do is to uh, solve the evolution of the temperature, right? So fill, fill these values. Make sense? So how do we do that? Well, uh, we discretize the PDE. So the PDE con contains partial, partial derivatives, and we discretize them using finite differences, both in time and in space. In time, that's what we have done already before when we were doing ODEs. So now we will have to combine with, with discretization in space. And here in this 1D advection uh, equation, it's sort of cool because you have several uh, options there. You, you sort of brought it up. And, uh, I will get a paper, I will explain that. So in general, if I have, um, so if I let go my beautiful continuous domain and I resort to uh, some uh, discrete samples, so let's assume I have a 1D function and I sample it at discrete locations here. So here will be my sample at T plus H. This will be my sample of T, uh, oh, sorry, I meant T minus H, X T plus H. Okay, so the, the idea is this, is this is my 1D domain. Some function X lives there and I, I know the values of the function only at these locations, okay? The idea is that this is very close, so it's sort of well approximating the continuous function. So I have three, uh, so if I want to approximate the derivative at this point t, I have uh, three obvious choices how to do that, right? Do you, do you, see, do you see them? I have, I have, so this, have some, this is my x here, right? I have the values some, somewhere here. And the idea is that they are samples of some function and I want to approximate the derivative of the function at this point t. So this is my t, this is my x. So there are three uh, of these choices. So what, what would you do? <laughs> the difference between the samples? Exactly, exactly. But which, which ones? <laughs> Exactly, exactly. So let's let, let me write it down. So there are, so let's start with the forward difference. So 
So forward difference would approximate, so we are approximating the derivative of x at t. And this would say that this is the, so forward, I'm looking forward. So xt plus h minus xt divided by h, right? The h is this step, that's this h here, the step between the samples, okay? So if I'm doing backward differences, by the way, don't confuse it with forward and backward Euler. That's something slightly different, related, but slightly different. What's the difference gonna be here if I'm doing backward differences? I guess you can guess it just from um, aesthetic or symmetry arguments. But, but what, is, what, what shall I write here for backward difference? Yes, exactly. Xt minus x, t minus h. Exactly. Right? So in forward difference, I was looking forward. So I was looking at these two values. And backward, I'm looking at these two values. Okay? Both of them are sort of fishy, right? Because one is biased to the right, the other one is biased to the left. So there is a third option called central differences. I think, I think we discussed that before, right, briefly. What is, what is the central difference approximation here? Somebody yell it out. <laughs> exactly, so that would be the two extremes, I assume it's xt plus h minus xt minus h divided by h, right? Oh, not h, 2h, exactly, exactly, because we are looking at value here, Subtracting value here, and so we are we have to normalize it by two h, of course. So this has the advantage that it's it's unbiased, right? It's it's nice nicely symmetric, but it also has a problem. Each each of them has a problem, right? Both of these are biased in in certain direction. So there is there is no way you can say one is the best. <laughs> That's why we sort of need, need to be mindful of all of them. And of course, it doesn't, doesn't end here, right? You, you could create a higher order approximations, even of the first derivative. But th those, those are, let's, let's not confuse things. Th those are the basic ones. Do you know what the problem is with central differences? Central differences look perfect now, or at least they don't have this bias of forward and backward ones, right? Do you know what the problem is there? You do? You do? <laughs> I'm just wondering about Already have the boundary values of the variables? Boundary values, that's 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 another problem, yeah. Like what what do you do at, at the very beginning, right? Yes, that's that's an issue, but that's that's a separate issue. Yes, we will we will we will um come back to that. You always have to do there something specially. I have a slide about this in, in a little bit, yes. <laughs> Okay, here, uh, I was just gonna say, since we are on this topic, uh, what is the problem of central differences? Certainly, if you, are, if, if you are at the boundary, then you have a problem, right? But you have a problem also with forward and backward, right? If you are hitting the boundary on one, on one side or the other, right? Okay. So if you are at the end of the domain, you have to do something about it. And we will talk about that in a second, yeah? It ignores the value of x of t, and this, uh, it ignores the value of x of t. Sorry, I didn't catch it. Ignores ignores the exactly so the problem of central differences is that it it doesn't care what is the value of x of t right and that's sad because that's exactly where we are trying to estimate the derivative right so it's like i ask you what is the derivative here and i just look here and here i don't even look what's here that's weird right and how how, <laughs> how is why is that weird like like the extreme case would be if if i have a function that that looks like this like a crazy like as high oscillations as you can capture on this uh, resolution, right? Function that oscillates between minus one and plus one, right? What will the central difference formula give me as an approximation of first derivative? Anywhere, really. Zero. So the central difference thinks this is constant, right? That's, that's not good, right? The finite or backward differences, they would come up with something a little more intelligent. <laughs> this is sometimes called the null space problem that left a function, uh, for function like this is in the null space of the operator. And I, I think, I think I, will, I, will, I will keep it there. So my point, uh, the punchline, I guess, is that 
it's good to keep in mind all of these uh, operators. And actually here, here it's sort of cool when we are solving the advection equation or in general in level set methods, but again, let, let me not uh, go too crazy. So uh, here, uh, here, here it's interesting actually. What, um, what type of these finite differences do you think we want to use here? So again, I'm simulating my temperature in Switzerland or whatever, or 1D approximation of Switzerland. So I, I have this, right? And now I have to march through all these values and compute Uh, compute the temperature, the discrete temperature profile at time uh, at time one. That's the next time. Okay. So the discretization in time. Well, there I will just use the forward difference, right? That sort that sort of makes sense because that that's what I want to be computing. That's what we were doing before with all all, the, all these Eulers. So he will just use forward differences to differentiate in time. But what is the right uh, thing to do in the spatial domain here? So here you have already a solution. Here you have one specific proposal. But think about it. What what do we probably want to do? What what type of the finite? We have three options, right? You have the forward, backward, and central. I will already tell you that the central differences are not a good idea. That they are not stable. So the choice is between forward and backward. Hmm? Backward. backward, assuming the C is positive. If the C was negative, if it, if it, if the C was negative, if it was if this thing was moving to the left, you you would you still want to use backward? Probably not, right? <laughs> because this the idea is this whole thing needs to evolve, right? So if C is positive, this whole thing needs to move to the right, right? So that means that the, the, this material travels from left to right, right? So where we do, where we want to be looking at is we want to be looking at at the left, right? If you are looking at the right, it, it, that, that, that wouldn't make sense, right, <laughs> intuitively. So this is called the upwind, upwind difference or upwind derivative, some, something like this, upwind scheme. So we want to be looking up, up the wind, essentially, because this, this thing travels in certain direction. So we want to bias uh, the finite differences against that direction. So we are, we are really, what we want to be doing essentially is mo moving this forward. So in this case, we are looking at, we are, we are using the backward difference because we go against the, the wind direction. Well, if you think about it, it's kind of the n plus one step anyway, because what's in the opposite direction of the wind is what's about to be mm -hmm. where you are. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Yes, I guess, um, correct. So. a good way to explain that. So let's go through it. Let, let's, let's, let's go through this. That will probably. So yeah, that's that's what I use. So here I assume that the C is positive and we discretize this using the back using back for differences. And what we do, we just we just uh, put this, we just multiply with delta T, put this on the right hand side. So we get an update rule for T T plus one. Okay, and that's that's how you can uh, solve that. Assuming we have the initial condition, there is there is as, as somebody pointed out there is the problem with the boundary conditions, right? What what do you do at the very first one, where you would be looking backward and you don't have anything there, right? Like a simple hack you can do, you can say that this is looped, so there is actually no boundary, which is sort of weird because it means that wh whatever is exiting here will, will be coming back here, but it's an it's an easy solution. Uh, we will discuss the types of boundary conditions, or you can just say that there is some 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 constant value coming, or, or something like that. No, no great way around this. We'll discuss the type of boundary conditions uh, in a little bit. Oh yeah, here is another uh, thing called CFL conditions. There is still. So even if you are looking up, yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let, let me try to explain a little bit better. I'm also confusing myself at this point. So, so let's try to look into that. Okay. 
So let's let's see that let's say that this is our discretized time axis in the previous time. So that's that's what we have already computed. Okay, so that's that's our t. And now we are computing at t plus one. So the spatial uh, samples are at the same locations. Okay. And let's say we are uh, we are now trying to let's we, let's say we have computed up to here, and now we are computing this guy here. Okay. So let's see. <clears throat> So here we had some function, right? And we know that this thing is moving to the right, right? By some speed. So uh, to so what we need to so we are we are talking about discretizing the derivative of the temperature profile with respect to space, right? This this is the spatial direction. Here here is the temp here is the time direction. So. What we need uh, the, the question here is what how are we approximating the spatial derivative uh, or the derivative with respect to x right so the question basically is uh, on what stencil here are we looking right and the, the logical answer is since the thing is moving to the right we want to be looking at this stencil right we want to be looking here and here right because from that's 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 what we have here that's what uh, we computed from at, at time t from the at, at point i and i minus one. So this is this is point i, this is point i, this is point i minus one. Okay, and that actually is not sufficient for this to be reasonable, right? You can imagine one um, point where this this will still fail, this upwind. So so by the way, so this is this is for sh this is a necessary condition that you want to be looking upwind, right? If you were looking downwind, if you were looking at these two. Then, then your your uh, approximation of the spatial derivative is essentially bogus, right? Because you are looking at something that will go away, right? Or it's already passed. It's already passed, exactly, exactly. Uh, but there, uh, this is not enough for this to succeed. There is another necessary condition for this to work. The catch is: imagine the thing was moving way too fast. Okay, imagine this was moving so fast that from, from time t to t plus one, this whole thing would shift by a ton. Like this, this whole would shift by like 10 spatial samples, right? Then we are again looking at the wrong, wrong stencil, right? Because we should be looking 10 back, right? Based on speed. So there is a thing, there is a thing called CFL conditions. CFL is for the guys who came up with it, Kuran, Friedrich, Slevy conditions. And they say that the necessary conditions for convergence is that the so the absolute value of the speed that's that's the absolute value of the c time delta t. So this is the the, the st spatial step it will do when we go from and when we advance one unit in time or one one time step must be uh, smaller than equal than h, where h is our um, spatial discretization. So that's that's the unit in space we discretize it. The, the delta t is the step in, maybe I could call it also delta x, that would be a little bit better. This is the delta x. So this basically says that the stuff cannot move faster, cannot travel faster than we are sampling it in space. Because if it does, things, things go south. So this is called the CFL condition. Oh, if the C is negative, it goes the other other direction. Here, here I'm talking about the positive C. Yeah, if 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 it's if you just reverse, you just mirror the whole thing for for, for the negative C. So if if it's if it's traveling this way, you certainly you want to be looking here. And again, it can't be traveling too fast, right? This this absolute value covers covers both cases. Okay. Cool. So now we will look at the zoo of PDEs. I guess that will, we will just look quickly at the zoo of PDEs. So here is just some notation you probably have heard, seen before. So the subscripts TT will mean second derivative with respect to T, probably time. XY would be um, mixed partial derivative. That's a gradient operator. That's what we discussed quite a bunch. The Laplace operator, this, this you probably know this notation. This is a divergence operator. 
So if I'm taking a divergence operator of a vector function f, so function f goes from Rn to R, then the divergence operator is the sum of the partial derivatives of the function. Again, you can think about it as a pre pre prep for fluids <laughs> where, where these things come a lot. So this is divergence. This thing is called divergence. And the divergence of the gradient, this is how it's sometimes denoted, is also known as the Laplace operator. Uh, it's usually denoted as delta. Some people also write it as the nabla squared. That's, that's the same thing. Okay, the Laplace comes up a lot. It will come up in fluids too. You cool with that? So here is, uh, I don't want to spend a ton of time on this. I just want to give you the basic zoo of PDEs. So the order is the order of the highest partial derivative. You'll typically be de dealing with second order PDE. They, they magically appear to be very important in, in, uh, or very good to approximate what we see in nature. Make the right statement. And um, nice uh, PD, uh, linear PDEs are good because they will give us linear equations to solve. And again, the, the standard um, disclaimer applies that if you have there some y squared or sinus or something like that, that should not, that does not mean it's a nonlinear PD. The nonlinearity means with respect to the unknown. Okay. The unknown here is u, that's what we are solving here. So these y squared and x squared, yes, they are nonlinear functions, but from the point of view of the PDE, they are just some constant functions. So this is still a linear PDE. This or the Navier Stokes equation, those those are nonlinear PDEs. Here, here we are doing, here we are multiplying the unknown with itself. So that would make that's what turns it nonlinear. Okay. I guess the standard disclaimer. <laughs> and here is the, I guess the, the main zoo of PDEs, the classification of second order linear PDEs because they are uh, particularly important, particularly cool. So what we can do is we can look at just the high, uh, the, the high order terms. So this would be the second partials with respect to x, the mixed partial. And so this is basically looking at the Hessian of u. And the lower order terms, they don't matter for this classification. So we just group them on the right hand side. And based on these coefficients a, b, and c, we can classify it into these three types. You've probably seen this before, right? The hyperbolic, parabolic, and elliptic PDEs. So this is what it is. By the way, the a, b, and c, they don't have to be constant. They, have, they can be functions. And then this means that this, this applies to some domain. I, so I hope I'm saying it right. You probably know this better than I do. <coughs> because it's been a while since I took a PD class. <laughs> so, yeah, so what does it mean, this parabolic, ellipsoid, and hyperbolic? Well, the idea is that we take an implicit cone, so let's spent a second looking at this formula. So this is an equation of a cone, right? If x squared plus y squared equals h z squared. If, if, you, if, you, if you square root it, you can see that this indeed gives us a cone. So something that looks like cone in 3D, something that looks like this. And we intersect it with a plane. So this is a plane in 3D, right? And what we get is an implicit conic section, which can be any of these three types. Okay, it can be a parabola in this case, it can be an ellipsoid or a hyperbola. And the way we find out which case it is, we uh, form this matrix. So this is the this is the Hessian of the implicit conic section. That's the ABBC matrix. We take its determinant. And the determinant, uh, the determinant of this matrix is AC minus B squared, right? So I guess you were looking at minus determinant, but it doesn't matter. And the determinant tells us which of these types it is, okay? So the parabola is exactly the corner case between uh, ellipsoid and hyperbola, right? The ellipsoid means it's, it's cutting a, um, only one of the cones the uh, circle would be a special case of an ellipse, right? So this, in this case, we are cutting it uh, at an ellipse or a circle. The hyperbola means at the, if we cut both of the sides, or is there a better term for that, both uh, parts of the cone. 
And parabola is, is the corner case when the plane is actually uh, parallel to one of the cones, so we, we are only gonna hit one. But the, the curve won't be closed. You kind of get like a nice, like, like try to imagine this, and as, as you are moving the plane, it, it's, it's hitting, hitting these cases. And what's beautiful is that each of these cases lead to different types of PDEs which correspond to different phenomena in nature, I guess. I can put it in this romantic <laughs> way. So the hyperbolic PDEs uh, are typically some time-dependent problems which sort of describe how some disturbance evolves in time. So the prototype is the wave equation we had before. This is the 1D version of the wave equation. If I, so because the, the U is just a function from R to 2R. If I uh, wanted to have a 2D or 3D wave equation, I'd have to replace it with, with the Laplace operator. So this I would replace with the Laplace of U. Or sometimes you can see this. It means the same thing, it always means Laplace. Uh, that's, that's what I said before, there's a sum of second derivatives in Euclidean domain. And this thing, this thing, the wave equation, you can have a lot of fun with it. Some graphics people had a lot of fun with it because that, that really describes like uh, things, things like in 1D, already in 1D it's actually cool. If, if you solve it, you can get things like vibrating string with it, right? Like, like string attached at two points, then you pluck it and then the wave travels back and forth. It's very cool. If you do it on 2D, you can you can simulate like ocean waves with it. Like, it's it's beautiful. I have seen so lots of cool graphics demos which are which are solving exactly the situation. It's 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 nice. Um, oh yeah, you can also in in 1D you can actually derive this sim similar way like how we derive the 1D advection equation. You can actually derive this for from Hooke's law. So you, could, you can connect, if I had like an extra lecture to spare, maybe not so long, but it would take a little bit. You can, you can do a mass spring system and you can massage it until you get this. By massage, you will, I mean, you will also do a limit uh, to convert it to continuous form. Okay, I don't want to say correct this, I want to finish this. Parabolic PDEs, that's, that's the corner case, right? When this determinant goes exactly to zero. So they are uh, also time-dependent problems, but unlike hyperbolic PDs, when there is some traveling wave, this typically means that something is smoothing out. So uh, the prototype is the heat equation, which describes if, if I have some uh, material and I heat some part of it, like imagine you put like a hot teapot on like some porcelain desk or something or on a, on a heat conducting steel table or something like this, then this PDE describes how the temperature will evolve in time. So this, this thing will sort of melt and eventually after long enough time it will get to constant temperature everywhere, right? Eventually it will equalize, right? You heat it about at some point, then it diff the heat diffuses and ultimately it will go to a constant. Again, another very, very beautiful thing. If you just like simulate this, you will immediately get very beautiful melting type animation. So that's, 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 that's the beauty of this. It's not just mathematics, but it, it already leads to some sort of cool visual effects. And uh, if you go with the, uh, with the heat equation to infinity, you get a steady state distribution. And interestingly enough, uh, this is exactly what's described by elliptic PDEs. I actually don't know why. You do tell me why is that that elliptic correspond to the steady state solutions, but that's that's what it is. The prototype for elliptic PD is, is the Laplace equation, very famous equation. So here on the left we have the Laplace operator. I could also write it like this, like the Laplacian of u equals zero, subject to some boundary conditions, which I will describe in a second. And what this describes is a steady state equation. So imagine I took some, I don't know, some slab of material and I fixed temperature distributions on the boundary of it. And I wanted to know what the temperature profile will be after I let this thing sit for a while and let the temperature settle, the temperature profile settle. So 
I guess it's like like here, if we if we let go the time to infinity, we get some steady state solution, some solution where no heat is traveling anywhere anymore, where it, where it's just settled. It's just like in elasticity, and we talk about mass spring systems. You are now playing with your cloth pieces, right? If you constrained all of the boundaries and, and you plucked it or, or like per, per turb it or just moved it to the constraints, it will be oscillating, but eventually the oscillations will die away and you will get a static solution where the forces are exactly balanced, right? The, all, all, the sum of all forces is exactly zero. That's a steady state solution. So here it's where no, no heat is traveling anywhere. That's a steady state solution, which corresponds to Laplace equation. Or general Poisson equation. If the right-hand side is non-zero, this would be called Poisson equation. OK, question? What do you mean by the translation with the equation is smooth if coefficients are? Hmm. I think this means the, let's see. OK, to be honest. Uh, my first prediction is I'm not sure, but um, okay. The solution of the Laplace equation are harmonic functions, which have coefficients. I'm not sure what is really meant by the coefficients. Ah. <laughs> so this this is like for general in the general case the Laplace equation is like a s specific example of that. I can't tell you like a, a, some some different example. Yeah, this 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 means the A, B, and C. That's right. So in the Laplace equation, it's actually quite cool because the solutions are known as harmonic functions, and they are they are C infinity on the interior of your domain, and they have some other interesting properties like the mean value property. Yeah, so I mean, th th this could easily be like a lecture, and, and it is a lecture by itself. Several like uh, lectures, in, probably in the math department. Okay, um, what we need to talk about are boundary conditions, because the PDE uh, typically has infinitely many solutions, right? So we need to provide some additional information, so so we get a unique solution, and this additional information typically means some boundary conditions. And in most of these physically based cases, it's sort of obvious, right? When I talked about the temperature distribution, if you want to know what a, what a steady state um, distribution is, you need to specify the values on the boundary of your domain. The other like pragmatic reason is that you are not able to compute uh, or estimate the derivatives reasonably on the boundary because you're just missing data beyond the boundary. So you have to do something about it, okay? I'll show you a, a specific example in a, in a second. So there are, uh, I guess, two main types of boundary conditions. I guess that's my main point here. Either you can directly specify the value at the boundary. That's what we did for the temperature profile, right? We just specified a point blank, what's the temperature distribution at time zero? Just specify. So this has the fancy name Dirichlet boundary condition. So Dirichlet is the synonym for the simplest possible boundary condition. You just, somebody just gives you the value there, okay? A little more fancy boundary condition, is no, and, but also very important, is Neumann boundary condition, which notice this, this subtle x, it means the partial derivative with respect to x. So instead of knowing the value, I know the partial derivative on the boundary. Okay, so that's, that's also quite important. And you can blend between them, mix, mix them together, and I think that's called Robin boundary conditions. But those are the main uh, cases. Okay, so let's um, look now at a specific example solving the Poisson equation. That's the Laplace equation with non-zero right-hand side. And let's take a look how we can solve it using finite differences and finite elements. And we'll again do a 1D uh, example because there it's nice and clear, even though it becomes more beautiful in 2D and 3D. Like you can get uh, some nice uh, solutions like this by solving the Poisson equation. So if this f is zero, it's called the Laplace equation. This is the Laplace operator here. So that means the sum of second derivatives. And it actually, the Poisson equation is 
occurs a lot in physics. We will see it in fluids. It definitely comes up in fluids. You can also look at it like in, in elasticity. You can imagine that your boundary is like a boundary of a drum. Okay. And I can specify the height at every point of a drum. So it would not be like a constant flat drum, but it would be like some, some curved, um, imagine some artistic creative drum shape. And then I stretch some elastic skin on it. Okay. And if it is F is zero, if it's the Laplace equation, then the, the position, the, the configuration of the main brain will be exactly described by the Laplace equation. That will describe uh, that's the thin man brain interpolant that will um, describe the steady state solution of it. When all the elastic forces have equalized themselves, we will get the, the solution uh, of the Laplace equation. And also, you, if it could also be a lot, uh, electric potential or heat distribution. In all these cases, it leads to the Poisson equation. Oh, the, what the Poisson thing does, if, if I give there a non-zero F, like in the drum example, you could imagine those are some forces acting on it. For example, if it was in a gravity field, the F would be the gravity force pulling down on every vertex. Or if there was some, some collider, it would be pulling on parts of the drum. Okay. So to find a different solution, that's essentially what we have done before for the 1D advection. So let's uh, take a look just quickly, how do we do it for the Poisson equation? So here we have a second derivative, right? So second derivative, we can also approximate using finite differences. So I guess let me um, talk uh, first a little bit about the, the discretization here. So here, here I have just 1D interval so I discretize it using points I will need some boundary conditions on the first and on the last one so the simplest thing is just assume directly boundary condition so somebody tells me how much it is at 0 and at 1 so let's say this is 1 for example you can say that it's fixed at 0 to make it simpler and then the task is to compute the values in the middle okay in the 1D case, it's actually all sort of dumb because you can probably guess what the solution is, right? If I tell you that I am on an interval A to B and I tell you that the function value at A is FA, that's here, and the function value at B is FB, what, what is the solution on this domain of um, the Laplace equation? It's, it's, it's sort of trivial to see immediately. <laughs> Oh, the, in, in 1D, the Laplace operator uh, boils down to second derivative, so the second derivative must be zero. In 1D, there is just one partial derivative. So, so what, is, what, what is the solution of the Laplace equation in 1D here? Okay, let, let me go through this first, and then, then I think the answer will be obvious. So if we do the discrete, this discrete approximation, we need a finite difference approximation of the second derivative. Okay. How do we do it? Well, second derivative is just the derivative of a derivative, right? So the ux is the first derivative. And I plug in the finite difference formula again, I, and I will get the approximation of a second derivative. Notice that this h changed to h squared because now we are approximating the second derivative. Okay. So this would be the finite difference approximation of, of the Laplacian in 1D. And this is the equation I will get at every internal grid point. So this two, two, this is, this is like one, two, this is n minus one. The boundary ones are special. This is, as, as, as you said before, in the boundary ones, I could not be looking left or right. So some, I have to do something special there, right? So the discrete uh, Laplace operator gives you a intu nice intuition about what it does. If you look at the stencil here, the coefficient of ui minus one, that's one. Here it's minus two and here it's one, right? That's the famous Laplacian stencil. You can also look at it as you can divide it by two. You can look at it one half minus one, one half, right? And that gives you sort of nice intuition about what the Laplace operator uh, does. What does it do if I, if I divide it all by two, then I will see that it gives me u i minus one plus u i plus one, I'll rearrange it already, divided by two minus u i. 
Right. So that's if I divide it by two and rearrange it, I'll get this. So this is the discrete approximation of the Laplacian. So what it does intuitively, it measures the difference from the average. Okay. So if I am a point, so if this is my, mm -hmm. no, let's do it here. This is ui minus one. This is ui. This is ui plus one. And here are some some values here. So what the approximation of the Laplacian at ui does, it computes the average of the values at ui minus one, ui plus one. So the average is somewhere here, and it computes the distance, the value at ui from the average. Okay. So when is the discrete Laplacian exactly zero? For what function? Straight line, exactly. If, it, if, it's a str if it's perfectly straight line, then it means that the average will be exactly equal to the value, so that means it will be exactly zero, right? And in, in the continuous world, it's exactly the same idea, except that this, this, this spacing goes, goes to in being infinitely small. So now, you can, now we can go back to the question, what is the solution here? If I ask you for a function f with the boundary conditions, by the Dirichlet boundary conditions at a and b, it's f a and f b. The, the second derivative of the function must be zero everywhere on the interior of this interval. It's just a line. Yep, it's just a line, exactly. As simple as that. So in 1D, it's really, really simple. But already in 2D, it starts doing interesting things, actually. If you, let's, oh yeah, I have this. No, I don't have it here. In 2D, um, if you imagine some 2D domain, even like a 2D square, right? Then now the Dirichlet boundary conditions, it means I can prescribe whatever value of the function I want anywhere on the boundary. Okay. So imagine you can create whatever you want. You can put like a sine wave here. You can carve any, any values on the boundary, right? Then you can do a 2D analog of the Laplacian uh, on the interior, solve um, the Laplace equation, and inside you will get the, the membrane interpolant which is actually quite beautiful. It really is something like if you, if you stretch the skin of a drum, respecting the boundary conditions, you will get some very smooth, very, very pretty looking interpolant inside. So that, that's why, that's, that's I think the main reason why this Laplacian is used a lot in graphics, because it gives you these nice, smooth, beautiful things. That's what like uh, people in graphics say, you can have large error, but as long as it's smooth, nobody will care because it will look good. <laughs> Uh, do you know how the Laplacian, uh, the stencil of the Laplace, this is the 1D stencil of the Laplacian. Do you know how it would look like in 2D? I guess I have it here. Sort of, I sort of have it here. Still have to think about it. So if we turn this into a linear system, we get a system like this. So there is some problem on the boundaries. And we solve the problem by plugging in the boundary conditions. Okay, so this this would this would correspond to the very first grid value, to the very to the uh, grid value to the very first sample. This this first equation would correspond to the estimate of the second derivative here. The last equation would be here. Well, here I'm sort of screwed because I cannot look left, right? Here I cannot look right. But what what saves me is Dirichlet specifically Dirichlet boundary conditions, which say that I already know the value here. If I know the value here, I don't know need the equality there. I can, I can just get rid of it, which is great because it wasn't really correct anyway. And I just plug in the value specified by the Dirichlet boundary conditions. And then inside everything is cool, right? If I'm looking here at this point already, then I already know what's on the left, what's on the right. Here would be the fixed value, but that's okay. Did it make sense? So for 2D, the 2D discrete approximation of the Laplacian, that's sort of obvious. If you have a uh, the, the 2D Laplacian would be this, right? If I have a 2D function U and the corresponding stencil, so the 1D stencil was like this, one minus two one. What is the 2D stencil? 
Do you know that? <laughs> Well, it's it's very simple. This is this is this is approximating the second derivative in the x direction. If I want to write in the y direction, it will look like this. And the Laplacian just says, well, sum them together. So, what do you think I will get? I think I will get this. If you have done some image processing, then you must you certainly must have seen that. <laughs> Comes up a lot in uh, digital image processing. So this is what is known as finite difference discretization. And it works really well on regular grids. And it's simple and easy to implement. We will use exactly that in fluids. Now, if you are not on regular grids, uh, if you are in some more complex domains, like on a polygon mesh, or if you are dealing with 3D objects and you have a tetrahedral mesh, why, why, why do you, well, okay, well, let me not go into the details, I need to, I need to finish this. <laughs> On more complex domains, it's um, better to use finite elements. So finite elements are, um, this is like a sort of intro to finite elements. I will do uh, more uh, detailed lectures on finite elements later when we'll talk about finite element elasticity. But that will be that will be later. So here I will sort of give you just like an appetizer of finite elements. So um, solving the 1D problem, the same we had before, 1D Poisson accuration using finite elements. So the so, so the game is to convert this continuous, perfect, beautiful continuous problem to a discrete domain, to convert it to a problem which has a finite number of degrees of freedom, finite number of unknowns, right? In finite differences, we did it by sampling uh, the, the domain and approximating the derivative using finite differences. And in FEM, the idea is different. In FEM, the idea is that if, if, the, if we have a solution, then certainly the, this equa equation will be also satisfied after we integrate, right? And it will also be satisfied after we take a dot product with an arbitrary function, V. We don't take arbitrary functions. We restrict ourselves only to smooth functions because later we will need to differentiate them. And these functions, we are called test functions, okay? And the whole idea of finite elements is that you have a whole bunch of test functions. And if these uh, equations are satisfied for enough test functions, then you have accurate enough solution. That's the main idea of FEM, at least in my viewpoint. And this is this is a math you can already act on because if a uh, because uh, now what we do I'll just do that quickly because I'm running out of time and I cannot do this justice anyway because this is that will be a lot of calculus. The the, the next thing you do you take this integral form this this integral equation and you apply integration by parts. And what happens if you do integration by parts is that one uh, order of differentiation disappears, right? That's how integration by parts work. And that's why it's called a weak form because uh, it get, you get one order lower derivatives than you started with. So we started with the second order uh, PDE here and we uh, here we need in the weak form just first order ones. So that's why it's called a weak. So because it would be weak, but that's... <laughs> And that the the other form will be called the strong form. Okay, I guess here is a comparison: the strong and weak form. So the strong form is with the second uh, order derivative, and the weak form is after we have done the integration and uh, dot dot product with the test functions. And the, the whole idea of the test functions is that now we design special type of test functions. So in 1D, so the test functions will be a sum of some basic shape functions. And the basic shape functions are these hat functions, this, this ni, okay? So I have an, here you already, here you can see first advantage of finite elements. Because before I had to, in finite differences, I better sample my interval at regular space uh, distances, right? This, this age, I always assume that to be constant. Otherwise, things get sort of complicated, things, things get ugly. 
But here it doesn't matter. Here you can use uh, any sampling of space. And each of the shape functions is a function that's one at, at its spatial location at xi and zero everywhere else. And linearly interpolates in between. Okay. And then the idea is that for my test functions, I use a linear combination of all these shape functions. Right? Here would be another shape function here, be another shape function here. They are also called hat functions. Hat, because it looks a little bit like a hat. So what the ritz galarkin ap approach is about, you express the unknown u as a linear combination of these shape functions. And the test functions we will also express in exactly the same way. They wouldn't necessarily have to be the same, but let's, let's, not, let's not go into that discussion. Let's just assume that they are exactly the same. And the, the shape functions essentially project the problem, problem from the continuous domain to a finite dimension uh, function space. And in a finite dimension function space, we can ultimately convert it to a system of linear equations, which we can then solve. OK. I guess I went over this a little bit quickly. So maybe we can, we can return to it when I'll be talking about um, finite element method uh, related to uh, elasticity, but we, but we'll talk about that. But I hope I got at least the main idea across. All right, I think we should finish. Okay.